And I think tonight is really going to open your eyes. And remember, we're nowhere near even begun. we got a lot of shows to do on this, folks. And it's going to blow your mind if it hasn't already. I think some of you out there already know that. Now, if we concede that Osiris is the positive pole of the universal life agent, as the mystery school does, then Isis becomes the receptive pole of that activity. He is the doctrine, she is the church. As in Christianity, it is customary to refer to the church as the bride of Christ. So in Egypt, the institution of the mysteries was the great mother, the consort of heaven herself. From this interpretation, we gain a deeper insight into the symbolism of the whole Osirian cycle. Isis, you see, becomes the temporal order of the priesthood, the accumulative body of initiates. She is personified as the temple. She is the mother of all good, the protectress of all right, and the patron of all improvement. Now remember, this is the belief of the mystery schools. I'm not telling you what I believe. What you're learning on this program is what the mystery religion really is. Its origin, its history, its dogma, and its identity. So don't get confused here. Don't get confused. According to the mystery schools, she ensures nobility inspires virtue, and awakens the nobler passions of the soul. As Diana of Ephesus, she is the multimania who feeds all creatures from herself. And many of you may have seen uh, illustrations in books or little statues or portraits or pictures on somebody's wall of Isis in the role of the multimania, where she has many breasts all over her torso and on her legs and arms, all over her body. Well, that's what this represents. As Diana of Ephesus, she is the multimamia who feeds all creatures from herself. Like the moon, she shines only with the light of her sovereign sun, spelled S-U-N, even as the temple can only be illumined by its indwelling truth. So Isis is the moon, Osiris is the sun. And remember, remember what this means, folks. He is the doctrine, she is the church. You see, the Osirian legend, the Osirian cycle, was never about real people. It was never about gods or goddesses. But it is the method by which the real object of worship and the real mystery of the mystery religion of Babylon has been concealed. And it is only one of the ways, as you will see. Typhon, according to the mystery schools, is the embodiment of every perversity. He is the negative creation, the Araman of Zoroasterism. And remember, we talked last Thursday about the movie 2001. And in the beginning of the movie, the musical score that you hear... The name of it is also Sprach Zarathustra, which is a tribute to Zoroaster, which is the androgynous god. The combination in one of the positive, the negative, good, evil, male, female, etc., etc., etc. It is the concept that Christ is also Lucifer, or that they are twins, and that's what they teach in the Mormon church. Typhon, according to the mystery schools, is black magic and sorcery, the black brotherhood, also known as the Jesuit order. Nephthys, his wife, is the institution through which he manifests. He is neither a single evil nor even a sequence of ills, but an infinite diversity of them, indescribably insidious empowered to infect the fabric of church and state. The enemy of the mystery schools are three, the church, the state, and the mob. And, of course, the mob is us. 
Typhon lured Osiris into the Ark of Destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, our Judas, that ageless Judas who undoes all good things and inevitably presages ruin. He is the power of the physical universe which is constantly seeking to destroy the spiritual values locked within its substances. You will see that they have a talent for turning things around. He strikes in the eighth month. And now it is supposed that a child delivered in the eighth month of the prenatal epoch cannot live because of the curse of Typhon. Osiris was born in the seventh month, and thereafter it may be said of him that he was delivered prior to the rule of Typhon. And that's why our forefathers, all Freemasons, established this country by the signing of the Declaration of Independence in the month of July. And this will all become clearer to you as we go along. Of all good things, Typhon is the opposer, according to the mystery schools, occupying the position of the eternal negative. This evil monster may well be generalized under the appellation of the adversary. In the initiation rites, he is also the tester or the trier. Quote, the Lord who is against us, unquote. According to the mystery religion, he is the personification of ambition, and ambition is the patron of ruin. It was ambition that set Typhon plotting for the throne of Egypt, designing how he should destroy the power of his brother. A learned Jesuit father sees in Typhon Cain and in his brother Osiris Abel, if such a parallel actually exists, then the biblical allegory is susceptible of the same interpretation. But you see, they have twisted everything around. Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, was a Jesuit priest and a professor at Ingolstadt University, which is a Jesuit university. The Jesuit order was founded by Ignatius Loyola. He was the head of the Ilumbrados in Spain which is the order of Illuminati long before Adam Weishaupt even came along. He was arrested by the Dominican monks under the Inquisition and used his power of association of those who had influence and power to beg an audience with the Pope. Now, nobody knows what occurred during this audience, but he emerged as the head of a new order called the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits was just another name for the Ilumbrado, for he took his organization that he already controlled and made it into the brotherhood of the Jesuits. The Jesuits went on to foment rebellion everywhere that they went and the Pope gave them incredible power and made Ignatius Loyola immune to any prosecution from any source. And it was they who trained Adam Weishaupt, and it was Adam Weishaupt who formed the branch of what we all know as the Illumined Ones, known as the Illuminati in Bavaria, where he sent out agents to infiltrate the lodges of the secret societies throughout Europe. Now you'll begin to understand this even more, folks, as we go along. Right now I understand how shocking some of this may be to some of you out there. But just hang on, continue to listen, because we have many, many more hours of this to go before it will all come together for you. <coughs> but I would suggest that you begin study on your own. It doesn't matter if you get ahead of us because you will always need some of the information that I'm putting out here, no matter how ahead you may get or what you already may know, simply because I've done well over 23 years of research into this, and I must know something that you don't know. <coughs> and if you know something that I don't, please send it to me immediately. 
and if we can substantiate it, we will incorporate it into this series. Now, let me continue. Typhus lured Osiris into the Ark of Destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, the ageless Judas, who undoes all good things and inevitably presages ruin. Now this may sound to you that we're talking about Satan or the devil. But you see, in the mystery schools, they consider their god, Lucifer, to be the true good god, and they consider the god of Christianity to be the evil god. Now, if you listened on the night of the 10th, you, or excuse me, the 11th of February, Thursday, you already understand this concept. Because the mystery religion of Babylon believes that man was held prison in the bonds of ignorance in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, and many believe them to be the same entity, and that's okay. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, released man from the bonds of ignorance with the gift of intellect. And through the use of that intellect, man himself will become God. And that's the heart and soul of the dogma of the mystery religion of Babylon. Now, since I am taking the content of all of these episodes directly from their own teachings and their own writings, so that you'll know that this is exactly what they believe, sometimes it may sound to you like these are the good guys. But remember, they are the ultimate perfection of deception. And they have intentionally made it this way so that they can get people to join them and stay with them until they're so deeply involved and committed that it's too late. And that is why the degrees of initiation. So stick it out and you'll find out that these guys are the greatest liars, deceivers, manipulators, and scum that exist upon the face of the earth. Typhon, in their teachings, is the desire of the few pitted against the good of the many. Now, if you understand what I just said, you understand that these are communists, socialists. They believe Typhon is the spirit of dissension and discord that breaks up unity of purpose by setting factions against each other so that great issues lose the name of action. The desire for riches, pomp, power, and, listen to this, folks, sovereignty, by which this evil genius was obsessed, reveals the temptation by which humanity is deflected from its ultimate goal and led into the byways of sorrow and despair. Typhon, the queen of Ethiopia, and the 72 conspirators represent the three destructive powers preserved to modern Freemasonry as the murderers of the master builder Hiram Abiff. You will see that Hiram Abiff was never murdered. In fact, in the Bible, you will see that when the Temple of Solomon was completed, he went back home to Tyre. But in the Freemason legend, Hiram Abiff, the master builder, was killed and the temple was never completed. So everybody is blaming all of this upon the Jews. It is not the Jews, folks because all of this is a front. It's symbology for what they really, really mean. Hiram Abiff was really, folks, Jacques de Molay of the Knights Templar. And all of this will make much more sense to you several shows down the road because we have lots and lots of information to go through before you put it all together. Now, these three destructive powers preserved to the modern mystery school, known as Freemasonry, as the murderers of the master builder Hiram Abiff, who was really Jacques de Molay, are ignorance, superstition, and fear, what they call the destroyers of all good things. When you get even deeper into their teachings, you find out that ignorance, superstition, and fear 
stand for the state, the church, and the mob. And those are the things that they have sworn to destroy and substitute themselves as the ruler of the world in a benevolent despotism, a totalitarian socialist state. Because from the very beginning, these people have been pure, true communist socialists. They are the heart and soul and core of international socialism. They believe the advent of greed and perversion marked the end of the Golden Age, the Osirian Age, which the Osirian cycle is just a symbology of this, and the Golden Age, of course, Golden Oro, always has stood for the sun. Osiris is representative of the sun. And outwardly, these people worship the sun, but the sun is just another symbol for their god, Lucifer, the light, the intellect. And with the good prince Osiris, the deeper truth, returned to his own land, he became the victim of a hideous plot. So what is this mysterious chest, so beautiful in its outer appearance, but so fatal in its application? Well, folks, Plato, who was wise in the wisdom of the Egyptians and who was an initiate of the mystery school, would have answered that it was the body that lures the soul into the sorrows of generation. Now, if this interpretation is projected into the social sphere, the chest becomes symbolic of material organization. Witness the application of this thought to Christianity, where the pomp and glory of the outer show of a vast ecclesiastical mechanism has all but destroyed the simplicity and dignity of the primitive revelation of the mysteries. That is their exact words. See, I didn't make that up. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the mystery school. And it is an indication, if you didn't think so yet, that Christianity is their enemy. They intend to destroy Christianity and all Christians. The blood will flow when the new world order takes power in the world. And if you sit back and say, well, I'm not worried because I'm going to be raptured, I feel sorry for you because you are going to suffer tremendously. Because in my research, I have found that most of the theologians in the Protestant religion of all denominations who are responsible for this doctrine of the rapture are Freemasons. And they are in control of the World Council of Churches. They are responsible for the bringing together of the different religions in the World Council of Churches to attempt to merge them all into one and then change the doctrine to the new world religion. If you don't believe that, you get off your little butts and go out there and start looking instead of just listening and accepting. For it is true. And their doctrine, folks, is Zionism. I can tell you right now, Jerry Falwell has admitted publicly that he is a Zionist. And we know that he is also a member of the mystery schools and many others that you follow blindly instead of reading the words of Jesus Christ you're all split up you know the original teachings of Christ have been so perverted that there are thousands of different sects of the Protestant religion and the Vatican is the original perversion of the mysteries established by a pagan Roman emperor, a worshiper of the sun. I hope you're all beginning to open your mind. And I know I'm going to get a lot of letters from a lot of fanatics who don't believe this. <clears throat> and those are the people who will be hurt the most when they find out that it is all true. When they find out that it is all true. 
Back to their doctrine. The murderers rush from the palace with the lead-sealed casket and cast it with its kingly contents into the dark waters of the Nile. Thus are the ideals which lead men into the paths of truth and righteousness obscured, and with truth no longer evident, according to them, error, which is the Christian church, can rule supreme. Typhon, by now you should know, that Typhon is their designation for Christianity. Typhon ascended the throne as regent of the world, swinishly gloating over a dejected humanity he had led into dark and devious byways. By the Nile, may we not understand the river of generation, in the current of which souls imprisoned in mortal nature move helplessly upon the never-ceasing current. Now they believe that truth is dead. And according to their belief, with truth dead, or at least exiled to the invisible world, material facts were superseded by opinions. Opinions bred hatreds, and men finally fought and died over notions both senseless and soulless. And that is another deception and another lie. For in my research, I have found that in every instance of the most terrible things and wars that have ever happened on the face of the earth, these men are the ones who have brought it about. <coughs> have brought it about. Greed became the dominating impulse, they say, gain the all-absorbing end, and ruthlessness the all-sufficient means. In the dark ages of uncertainty when reality hid its face and no man dared to know, the leering typhon ruled his ill-gotten world, binding men to himself by breeding a thousand uncertainties to sap courage and weaken conviction. Men ask, why well, seek to know? Knowledge does not exist. Life is a cruel jest, purposeless and of short duration. Because the human mind demanded intellectual expression, Typhon sowed the seeds of intellectual confusion so that numerous orders of learning appeared which were convincingly plausible but untrue. These various orders of thought survived by catering to the weaknesses and limitations of the flesh. Today, our great industrial civilization is feeling the heavy hand of an outraged destiny. The evil genius of our ambitions has again undone us and our follies crumble about us. Typhon rules the world for the earth today is the arena of the ambitious. Remember, Typhon is their symbol for Christianity. Don't go away, folks. I've got to take a short break. I'll be right back after this short pause. I want you to have a pencil and paper with you. I'm going to give you some information I shall return. What then of Isis, the mother of the mysteries? She who was so defiled and desecrated by the profane that her sages and prophets were forced to flee into the wilderness to escape the machinations of the evil one. Is she not the woman clothed with the son of Revelation who flees with her man-child into the wilderness to escape the evil purposes of the great dragon? Well, folks, that's what the Mystery School believes, but I can tell you that's not true. You see, the Mystery School was the original college run by Nimrod in the city of Babylon. And the college was a college of priests who practiced the religion of the sun. The college, the adepts, the initiates, the priests were scattered all over the world when Seth, the son of Noah, came with an army and defeated Nimrod. And this is where the legend really comes from, because Seth chopped Nimrod up into little pieces and scattered him all over the land. In the legend of the Osirian cycle, Cyrus was chopped into 14 pieces, Isis came to put him back together again and bring him to life. She could find all the pieces save one, the phallus, or the generative force. It is now known as the lost word of Freemasonry. And the phallus is represented by the obelisk, the monolith. It is the penis of Osiris, the generative force. It represents the lost word of Freemasonry. It represents the Luciferian philosophy. 
It represents the light, the sun, Lucifer, the intellect. In Dealey Plaza, you will find an obelisk. In Washington, D.C., you will find an obelisk known as the Washington Monument. In the courtyard of the Vatican, you will find an obelisk. Should I continue? The family in England, whose estates are called Sion House, has an obelisk on their lawns. Should I go on? I will. I will go on and on and on and on until you either wake up or I am dead, one or the other. And if you don't wake up, I would rather be dead than live in slavery in the New World Order with our Constitution destroyed, the family broken, the children taken from the homes to be raised by the state, Christians and patriots locked in prison camps, labor camps until they are no longer useful and then they will be executed. And the blood will run in the New World Order. If you don't believe me, look back at every single nation where international socialism has triumphed over Christianity. And you will see that tens of millions perished were destroyed. Socialism, folks, sucks, and I will not live under such a system, and I hope you agree with me. If you don't like my language, that's tough. I'm fighting a battle against people with no morals, no decency, no heart, no soul, no soul. They do not even believe in God. They do not even believe in God. The glory of Egypt, according to these people, ceased with the death of Osiris. The mighty temples still stood, but the God who illuminated them had gone. The priests bowed helplessly before the dead embers of their altars. And one by one, the sanctuaries crumbled into ruin, and the custodians of these ancient truths hid themselves in obscure corners of the earth, lest they be hunted down and slain for the sin of dreaming and hoping for a better day. Isis, then, as the scattered but still consecrated body of initiates, began the great search for the secret that was lost. And this is all in reference to Seth's army scattering the College of Priests in the ancient city of Babylon. And later, it refers to the Knights Templar, who brought the mysteries from the Middle East to Europe. In the beginning, folks, they were never a part of the Catholic Church, as you will learn, and they still exist today, regardless of what you've ever been taught. For they are the mystery school today. In all parts of the world, according to their teachings, the virtuous raised their hands to the heavens, pleading for the restoration of the reign of truth. This congregation of those who prayed, who labored, and who waited, the great congregation of a world in anguish, this is Isis in sackcloth and ashes, searching for the body of her Lord searching in all parts of the earth and throughout innumerable ages, inspired men and women, the congregation of the just, at last rediscovered the lost arcana and brought it back with rejoicing to the world over which it once ruled. Isis by magic, for the initiated priests were all magicians, and they are magicians today, resurrected the dead god, and through union with him brought forth an order of priests, under the collective title of Horus the Hawk, the all-seeing bird, whose eye is on the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America. These were the Herj Shesta, or the companions of Horus, and the chief of these, called by Louis Spence, the chief of the mysteries par excellence, 
appears to have worn the dog-headed mask of Anubis. Anubis was the son of Osiris by Nephthys, the material world, therefore represents the divine man or the mortal being who rose to enlightenment. And those who rose to enlightenment were considered illumined. Collectively, they are known as the Illuminati. And all of you who have fallen for the scam that the Illuminati does not exist, they do. For the term Illuminati merely refers to the collective body of those who are illumined or enlightened. And they are the Illuminati. Ambition, however personified by Typhon, knowing that temporal power must die if divine power in the form of truth be reestablished, put forth all its power again to scatter the doctrine, this time so thoroughly that it should never be rediscovered. If Typhon, as Plutarch has suggested in one of his manifestations, represents the sea, then it appears that this second destruction of Osiris may refer to the Atlantean deluge. There's Atlanta again. Atlantis. Atlanta. The same. Go to Atlanta, Georgia, folks. Drive around in that city. You will see pyramids everywhere. You will see 666 everywhere. You will see the symbols, the all-seeing eye. Osiris may refer to the Atlantean deluge by which the doctrine was swallowed up or lost and its fragments scattered among all of the existing civilizations of that time. And the story continues. The body of Osiris, the secret doctrine, is divided into 14 parts. Remember, Osiris was chopped into 14 parts. They found all save one, the phallus or the penis of Osiris, well, the body of Osiris represents the secret doctrine. It's divided into 14 parts and divided among the parts of the world. And the lost word of Freemasonry is the generative force, the lost part of Osiris, the lost part, the secret of the secret doctrine. So we must therefore understand that it was scattered through the seven divine and seven infernal spheres the locusts and tales of India, or by different symbolism, to the seven worlds which are without and the seven worlds which are within, the Kabbalah of the Jews. Bacchus was torn into seven pieces by the Titans and Osiris into fourteen pieces. To use the words of Faber, quote, both these stories are in substance the same, for the second number is merely the reduplicate of the first. By a variation of much the same nature, the ancient mythologist added seven Titanides, and seven Kabiri to the seven Titans, unquote. The parts of Osiris were now scattered so hopelessly that ambitious Typhon, or the Titans, felt his authority to be secure at last. But wisdom is not thus easily to be cheated. Listen to this carefully, folks. This is their own words. In the dark retreats of Islam, the Sufi explored the depths of nature. Among the Jews, the learned rabbins unraveled the intricate skine of Kabbalism. Among the Greeks, initiates rose to life through the nocturnal rituals, rituals of Eleusis. In India, neophytes were brought to the contemplation of the triple-headed Brahma at Elephanta and Ellora. Through the Middle Ages, the alchemists in their retreats explored the infinite chemistry of existence. The Illuminati sought the pearl of great price, and Rosicrucian adepts sought to recast the molten sea. All these together were but Isis, still searching for the members of her lord. At last, according to the tradition, all these parts were restored again but one. But this one could not be returned. Now you understand why I tell you it's not the Jews, folks. If you're persecuting the Jews, you're making a big mistake. It is some of the Jews. It is some of the Catholics. It is some of the atheists. It is some of all of the people of all of the nations and races and religions of the world. And outwardly, if they attend a church in your neighborhood and profess to believe in that religion, it is a lie. It is how they gain influence and power in that community, for they worship one God and one God only 
in the temple without windows, the headquarters of which in this country is exactly 13 blocks from the White House. The Egyptian allegory tells us that the phallus of Osiris was swallowed by a fish. Now, folks, this is most significant, and we may even infer that mankind itself is the fish, but it even goes any further, for this age has been known as the age of Pisces, the fish. The significant force and the power in the age of Pisces was Christianity, and the fish actually refers to Christianity. The phallus being the symbol of the vital power of the mystery school, and so used in Egyptian hieroglyphics, the phallus, then, is the lost word which is not discovered, but for which a golden replica is substituted. In the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the physical body, after the death of the soul or its departure therefrom, is called the khat, or K-H-A-T, and the hieroglyphic for this is a fish. Thus, the physical body of man is definitely tied up in symbolism with the creature which conceived son, Horus, a term concealing the collective body of the perfected adepts who were born again out of the womb, swallowed the triple phallus of Osiris, the threefold generative power. This golden phallus is the three-letter word of Freemasonry, concealed under the letters A-U-M. And all of those of you in the, in the New Age movement, or all of those of you who fell for all these gurus who came over here and taught you to sit and meditate, and while you were meditating, hum this, aum, a-u-m. <laughs> The golden phallus is the three-lettered word of Freemasonry concealed under the letters A-U-M. How do you feel, sheeple? And why do you do these things? Because somebody tells you to. Isis, by thus modeling and reproducing the missing member of Osiris, gives the body of the god the appearance of completeness. But the life power folks, is not there. Isis, the priesthood, with their initiatory process, had accomplished all that could be accomplished by natural philosophy. Therefore, recourse is again had to magic. The golden phallus is rendered alive by the secret processes rescued from the lost book of Thoth. Thus, the divine power of Osiris is restored through the regeneration of man himself and the processes of initiation. In the Greek system, man was rendered divine because his composition contained the blood of Bacchus, they believe, and in Egypt because it contained the seminal power of Osiris. The institutions raised in the world to perpetuate the deeper truths of life, according to them, labored on through the centuries seeking for the lost key, the living crux and fata, which, if rediscovered, would enliven and impregnate the whole world and restore the good king Osiris to the throne left empty by his cruel death. The purpose of the Isaic rite is therefore revealed as twofold. The first motive was the almost hopeless effort made by the bereaved Isis to restore her husband to life. She hovers above his corpse in the form of a bird, trying to restore his breath by the fluttering of her own wings. This ceremony is concealed in the book of the Respirations. The causing of Osiris to breathe again is the great abstract ideal. The second and more imminent motive which actuated Isis was to avenge herself upon Typhon, Christianity, and to destroy his power over the world. This she determined to accomplish through her immaculately conceived son Horus, which is a term concealing the collective body of the perfected adepts who were born again out of the womb of the mother, Isis, the mystery school. Now we can apply this analogy to a great modern system of initiation called Freemasonry, which has certainly perpetuated at least the outer form of the ancient rites to the profane or to the members on the lower rung of the initiatory ladder. 
to the adepts or the priesthood, the higher initiates, then it is clear. You see, for Freemasonry as an institution is Isis, the mother of mysteries, from whose dark womb the initiates are born in the mystery of the second or philosophic birth. Thus all adepts, by virtue of their participation in the rites, are figuratively, at least, the sons of Isis. As Isis is the widow seeking to restore her lord and to avenge his cruel murder, it follows that all master masons or master builders are widows' sons. They are the offspring of the institution widowed by the loss of the living word, and theirs is the eternal quest they discover by becoming. In the Egyptian rites, Horus is the savior avenger, son of Isis conceived by magic or the ritual, after the brutal murder of Osiris. Hence, he is the posthumous redeemer. Freemasons are Hori. They are the eye of Osiris, whose body, therefore, is made up of eyes. Each initiate is a Horus. Each is a hawk of the sun, spelled S-U-N, and for one reason is each raised, and that is that he may join the army, which is to avenge the destruction of wisdom and restore the reign of the all-seeing Lord, Lucifer. Each one is dedicated to the overthrowing of the reign of Christianity. The great battle in which the sons of the hawk rout the hosts of darkness is the mysterious Armageddon of Revelation. You see, they believe Lucifer is the god of light, and Jehovah, or Yahweh, is the god of darkness. They believe that the Armageddon of Revelation is the Kurukshetra of the Mahabharata and the Ragnarok of the Eddas. In this battle, the hosts of the adversary shall be routed forever. The great purposes of the Osirian rite are thus revealed in an unsuspected clarity. The Hershesti are philosophically opposed to the reign of ambition. It is their duty to reestablish that golden age when wisdom personified as Osiris and not selfishness personified by Typhon shall dictate the whole course of human procedure. The day must ultimately come when the Horai, by virtue of their royal purpose, uh, accomplish the consummation of the great work. The great work, folks, is the elevation of man to the illumined man, or 666, and the establishment of a one-world totalitarian socialist utopia on earth. The missing word will be found, and the golden substitute will be replaced as promised in the ancient rite. Osiris will rise in splendor from the dead and rule the world through those sages and philosophers in whom wisdom has, been, has become incarnate. It should be particularly noted that the Egyptians do not regard Osiris as wholly dead, but view him as continuing to live in the underworld where he superintends the ceremony of the psychostatia. The underworld is not the sphere of the dead alone. It is the world of the mysteries. Lucifer is therefore God of the hidden fane, the temple which is beneath the earth, the house of the low ceiling, the crypts into which the initiates go in search of truth. He is the dweller who abides in the darkness of the innermost. His throne is not in the objective world, but in that subjective sphere which is the inner life of man. They believe that thus is it arcanely intimated that while truth may perish from society, it cannot die from the heart which preserves the sacred tradition through that natural inspiration by which all men are gradually moved to truth. In the meantime, the widow Isis, the mystery school, continues to produce out of herself the host of potential redeemers. Spiritual education continues from age to age in secret, and though temporarily obscured in this generation or in that, its onward process, they believe, is inevitable. Out of the hidden house, guarded by the silent God, must someday issue the glorious and illumined Horus. 666 is the number of that man. The very incarnation of his own father, Osiris or Lucifer, the personification of the Lord of Abydos, the avenger of all, and the just God in whom there is no death. 
Folks, tonight's episode of the Hour of the Time has been brought to you by the Pilot Connection. Give them a call. They can help you. Their number is area code 209-5493. That's 209-5493. Or you can write to them at 6333-Pacific Avenue, Nine five two zero seven. That's six three 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 Pacific Avenue, three 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 four, Stockton, California. Nine five two zero seven. Good night, and God bless you all. Amen.